all music is life, and all life is music, Uncle Nigel said to me almost matter-of-factly as the train chuckety chunked its way through the late morning countryside. I suppose I should have been surprised, not at what he said, but at the fact that he was even there at all. After all, the whole purpose of my journey was to attend my uncle's funeral. Or at least that's how it had started out. But somehow I wasn't surprised. England seems to lend itself to strangeness. I hadn't been back since my father's funeral two years earlier, which was also the last time I'd seen Nigel, his grief sitting uncomfortably, even incongruously, on his round and usually jocular frame. Dad's death had hit him hard, though he'd tried to cover up his grief for my sake. He needn't have bothered. Dad and I hadn't been much of an item since my university days, and my leaving for the States had been the last straw. That was seven years ago. In the years leading up to his death, we'd become estranged, like lovers who tire of each other's company. I knew something about that, too. Nigel and I had maintained an infrequent contact, exchanging occasional letters filled with pleasantries and politeness, but which were as devoid of breath and life as my father had been lying still and silent in the lounge of his old house. The final letter didn't even come from Nigel, but instead appeared one day in the box outside a house in Wells, covered in the faint, birdy scrawl of Aunt Dorothy. Just looking at it, you could tell it was bad news. Nigel was ill, the letter said. Very ill. Cancer. My uncle had lost a lot of weight and they were simply waiting for the end. It couldn't be long. By the time Susan telephoned Dorothy, the letter and its contents were five days old. Nigel had gone. Long before the arrival of that letter, my house had become a pioneer's trail and Susan and me, we had become two ragged, road-weary wagons passing each other on a long, tiresome search for something we'd misplaced. We didn't know what it was, nor did we even understand it. We just knew it was missing. Ringing Aunt Dorothy was one of the few things Susan had done for me in more months than I cared to think about. I didn't even want to think of what I had done for her. I knew it didn't amount to very much. It was Susan's idea that I come over and attend the funeral. First, I hadn't wanted to, but then... I got to see the trip as some sort of pilgrimage. Back to the old country, travel the old road, see my past again. Neatly folded and stacked away like old clothes in a hidden drawer. Maybe the thing I'd lost was in that drawer. Tucked between a pair of threadbare denims and a shirt I could no longer get into, smelling as fragrant and as natural as a lavender potpourri. Everybody needs a touchstone. Something on which you can rest a hand and say, Yes, that's it. That's all that matters. I decided I had to find that touchstone. Find myself. With a minimum of preparation and even less communication between Susan and me, I drove to Boston, caught the flight to Heathrow and arrived in England on the kind of summery mid-morning that I'd forgotten could even exist. The journey from Heathrow to the King's Cross station was filled with hustle and bustle. The tube carriage, a kind of mobile Tower of Babel, packed with seemingly endless dialects and accents and languages, I, I felt immediately at ease. What are tourists except people searching for answers? Me, I was also looking for the question. A 
and the chaos of King's Cross gave way to the sombre calmness of a train bound for Leeds. There I had to change for a local connection to get to Harrogate, my old hometown. It was while we were passing through Peterborough that Uncle Nigel appeared, looking as large as ever I remembered him when he was alive. I turned away from the window with its endlessly spinning stream of captured fields and trees to look at him. He smiled and gave a small nod and then looked back out of the window. It's all about us, he said with a soft, satisfied sigh. From the simplest bird song to the most complex orchestral composition, it breathes, it lives. I closed my eyes tightly and then opened them again. Uncle Nigel closed and opened his own eyes a couple of times in an affected squint. Yep, you're still there too, he said with a chuckle. But I'm a but though there was nobody within earshot. By virtue of the fact that I was in the smoking compartment, the rest of the carriage was almost empty. Only one other passenger, an elderly man chained smoking B&H and reading the Times, accompanied me through the countryside, and he was down near the split into non-smoking. The sunshine streamed through the windows, dappling the seat backs and bare tabletops and shining off his bald head. All around him, swirling slate-blue smoke, drifted lazily to the sound of the train's momentum. And I'm dead, but I won't lie down. The most obvious questions to ask him were why he was there, and why he had faked his own death, but that would have suggested that I did not fully accept that he was dead. And something deep down inside of me did accept that. Just as it accepted that it was possible for dead people to appear to their relatives on long train journeys. There was a dreamlike quality to the entire situation, and who ever heard of a dreamer questioning the logic of events into which he is immersed? So instead, a far more important question suggested itself to me. What's it like? I said at last. Death, I mean. The smile fell from Uncle Nigel's face, and he seemed to stare at me more intently. It's quiet, he said. What is it that they say? Quiet as the grave. Well, that's what it's like. No sounds, no music. I shook my head and started to get up. I'm imagining this. I muttered to myself, jet lag, something. Something I had, maybe. You're not imagining it, John. They're all gathering down at the house now. They're rehearsing their platitudes, their eulogies, straightening out their crumpled black ties, pressing dark trousers and sombre dresses, practising their expressions of grief and sympathy. None of it actually means anything. He made a facial expression as though he had just eaten something unpleasant and then, setting his jaw firmly, the merest hint of a smile. More to the point, I'm not going. Not going, I said, sitting down again. N not going where? I'm not going into the ground. I remembered when he and my father would sit for hours listening to music. They'd put on record after another into the turntable and then sit silently, reverently, almost living a particular song and then discussing it while one or the other of them ferreted out another record. Music had been their passion, their raison d'etre. A mythical chalice they would turn over and over in their hands, admiring it anew each time. Without it they were nothing. Sitting there in the train carriage, on my way to my uncle's funeral, talking to his ghost, I presume that's what he was now. I remembered a conversation with my father back when we were still speaking. When I'd asked him which of his senses he'd be prepared to give up if he had to. It's one of those silly hypothetical questions concerning a situation that would sort of even happen. But rather than dismiss it as so many would, my father had thought long and hard, stroking the memory of his beard as he decided upon the appropriate answer. Loss of his hearing, 
and as a result, an inability to appreciate his beloved music was what he finally told me would cause him most anger. And then he had added, but my memory comes a close second. We sat for a while, my dead uncle and me, watching out of the carriage window, till I resolved to find out what really troubled him. Is it so difficult to cope with? I said at last. Being dead. My uncle stretched his legs under the table and shuffled himself back into his seat. As I said, it's quiet and it's dark. He shrugged his shoulders and straightened his jacket lapels. We come from darkness, you know. He closed his eyes and in a lilting voice sang the opening lines of Simon and Garfunkel's Sounds of Silence. When he opened his eyes, they seemed to focus from far away as though they were returning to him, to the train carriage, from a long way away. And they were glassy and moist. Darkness is an old friend for all of us, he said softly. I nodded. It had been a perfect rendition of the song even down to the fact that I had imagined the rhythmic picking of a solitary acoustic guitar. And how about this one? He cleared his throat, opened his mouth slowly. Suddenly there was a waft of music, of distant instruments, a guitar, two guitars maybe, playing what sounded almost like a Scottish refrain. And then Uncle Nigel started singing in a gentle, warbling falsetto. It was another song that seemed to concentrate on darkness, but it was one I didn't recognise. A band called The Young Bloods, he said, recognising my blank stare. From an album called Elephant Mountain, 1969. What, what about this one? The carriage turned suddenly cold and alien, and there was the strongest sensation of something awakening and turning over in the seats around us. My uncle closed his eyes and seemed to drift into a trance-like state. His expression was one of pain, but bearable, almost beautiful pain. The sweet pain of loss, of grief, and the sounds that issued from his mouth reverberated inside my head. For just a few magical seconds, it was as though Uncle Nigel's bridge work had scooped up a radio and transmission from the ether and sent the sounds floating from his open mouth. It was all there. Voices and instruments. Jim Morrison couldn't have performed it better himself. As though coming round from a seance, Uncle Nigel opened his eyes and gave me a half smile. It seemed almost like an apology. Morrison had it right, you know. I frowned. Uncle Nigel waved a hand languidly. Paul Simon talked about darkness being an old friend, which is true, but Morrison had it bang on the button about music being our only friend. He meant it's our truest friend. I shook my head. Still wasn't following. Because it's music that gives light to the darkness. I looked nervously at the surrounding seats. Whatever had caused the restless movement around us had ceased now that he had stopped singing and the carriage seemed to have regained much of its earlier warmth. I slid in an attempt to fill the sudden void of silence. They were one of Dad's favourites, the doors. He nodded, half closing his eyes. I looked out as we sped past a small station lying weed festooned and overgrown, forgotten since the great clampdown of the fifties. Uh, have you seen him S since you went over? M my dad, I mean. I know where he is, he said. Is he all right? As far as he can be, yes. What does that mean? Either he's all right or he's not. He's all right. Does he ever... Does he ever mention me? Nigel smiled. Now and again. 
neither of us spoke again for a few minutes. And then my uncle said, Know why we fear the dark? Because, he went on without waiting for me to respond, with darkness comes the silence. It's why we're so scared of death. We come from darkness and it's to darkness we return, but in between, we have discovered music. And it's the loss of music that scares us the most. Uncle Nigel brushed at a tiny piece of lint on the front of his jacket, and then folded his arms. Darkness is nothing. It's the numbness of being. He paused and then continued. Light, on the other hand, is energy. In turn, energy is life. Life is movement, no matter how small. Movement is sound, no matter how faint or distant. And sound, dear John, is music, no matter how free for more avant-garde it might be. It's the thing we search for all our lives. Search for it as though it were a mystic talisman. It's the thing... It's the thing we search for all our lives. Search for it as though it were a mystic talisman, a keepsake. He looked out of the carriage window through his smile beyond the glass and his half-seen reflection through it to the countryside that lay humming in the sunshine. It may be the bubbing of two twigs or the leaves of the trees rustling on a windy day, he said. It could be the noise of that wind breaking through... It could be the noise of that wind through the feathers of a mountain bird in flight, a rock slide or a rainstorm, waves breaking on the shore, a car engine, a baby's cry, the sound of footsteps on an empty street, the sound of this train. He turned back to face me. Do you hear the music of the train, John? I did. It went chuckety chunk, chuckety chunk. Yes, I said, I, I hear it. But what has all this to do with you not wanting to be buried? Just saying it made me feel incredibly stupid. The man at the end of the smoking compartment suddenly stood up and walked away, presumably toward the buffet car. It was as though he were leaving a theatre in protest at the banality of the performance he'd just paid good money to watch. Nigel waved the question away with his hand. Whenever I walk along, sorry, walked along Shaftesbury Avenue, I always used to think of a piece by uh, Les Dudek called Central Park. It used to epitomise the throngs of people, the hustle and the bustle. And when the evening gloom came to the house, I would often walk out into the garden and think of the moody blues twilight time. It was like all things in my life had musical references. He laughed and threw back his head. Hell, my life itself was one long musical reference. I loved life, John. Loved it. I didn't want to die. Nobody want. Yes, I know, nobody wants to die. But with me, it was something more. Who else do you know that plays such story music? Well, my, apart from your father, I mean. I shrugged and shook my head. You <laughs> see, it's lost on most people. They don't grasp the significance. Life is the longest single note of all, John. 
We're a musical species. We come from darkness and silence into a world of noise and light. We translate all of our existence into musical as well as visual images. Soundtracks for films, music in church and at funerals. Oh, I wonder what they'll be playing at mine. Oh, it certainly won't be Jimi Hendrix. More's the pity for that. It'll be something... something funereal. You see, we even have a word for that kind of music. Lost and cold music, especially produced... Lost and cold music, especially produced to reflect off the alabaster strangeness of someone we once knew but no longer even recognised. He stopped for a few seconds and looked back at fields and hedgerows speeding by. You wouldn't have recognised me at the end. I'm sure I would, I said. It seemed that he needed the reassurance of his own identity. I was thin. God, I was thin. Like a skeleton. I looked at him and tried to imagine such thinness transferred onto my uncle. And in doing that, I began to wonder exactly why he was here. What is it that you want of me? I asked. He seemed not to hear the question, or if he did, he chose to ignore it. Have you noticed how? He said. In a Western movie, when someone walks into a saloon, a fellow playing the piano stops. It's the threat, the imminence of death. That's why he stops playing the piano. He stops the music. Yes. I said, God help me, I was beginning to make a, I was beginning to make a kind of sense suddenly, a fractured logic. And how all movies always have to have a music soundtrack. Even in the days of silent films, we had to have somebody sitting playing the piano to emphasise what was happening on the screen. Chuckety chunk, chuckety chunk, sang the train. What do I want of you? He said after a while. I want you to dig me up. The man down the carriage returned with a lidded plastic cup and a shrimp-wrapped sandwich. He sat down and I watched him remove the lid from the cup and then start to eat his sandwich. I turned to look at my uncle and shook my head. Why? Why? Because the ground is dark and silent, that's why. But you won't be in the ground. Well, your body will be, but you... I waved a hand in his general direction. Whatever you are, you're here now, and your body is, I don't know, lying in a state, I suppose. So why should you be affected? John, he said. I came to you because of your father, because of everyone I know, even Dorothy, you might understand what I've tried to tell you. It's quiet over there, deathly quiet. And the reason is that you carry, the reason is that you carry with you the sounds of where you rest. Why do you think they stole Graham Parsons' body? Why do you think they did it? Who's Graham Parsons? Not Graham. Graham. He was a singer. Musician. They stole his body after he was dead. Uncle Nigel nodded. And he wasn't the only one. There have been others. But Graham is the only one who's a that's actually documented. Who? Uh, uh, who's stealing these bodies? <laughs> he laughed. It's not important, it's why that matters. I was entranced. Okay, why? To leave them where it's light, where there's some sound. He said it like he was explaining one plus one to a five-year-old. And that's what they take with them. To heaven. Heaven's yeah, just a state of mind, John. An adjective like great or marvellous. The flip side is how we think of it. We whose lives have revolved around music. Okay, who's we? He looked at me, kind of frowning and mashing his lips together. I was immediately aware of the train slowing down, not slowing as if it were coming to a station, but rather just becoming less frenetic, less agitated. Everything suddenly became very calm. This is we, he said, and he pointed out of the window. I had heard about Woodstock, 
and the other big music festivals held in the 1960s and 1970s from my father. And I'd seen the film. Well, looking out of the train window that day was like looking out on the audience at Woodstock. Only the people standing out in the fields were not merely watchers, they were listeners, innovators of sound. People to whom music had been everything. There was the Big O, Big Bopper, Benny Goodman, Elvis, Janice, Mario Lanza, Morrison, Jimmy, Buddy Holly, Dennis Wilson. Uncle Nigel was pointing them all out because, don't ask me how, the train had slowed right down and we must have been doing only about five miles an hour. I looked around at the man down the carriage and he was sitting holding a cigarette half in, half out of his mouth, with his lips curled in a seemingly endless snarl. A thin freeze-framed trail of smoke curled around his face. There's Nat King Cole, my uncle said. And Liberace, John Lennon, George Harrison. I recognised them straight away. Karen Carpenter, who's no longer thin at all. Keith Moon. Glenn Miller, Rick Nelson, Bing Crosby, Dudley Moore. The list was endless. Names I knew and names I had never heard of before. Suddenly I felt my uncle's hand on my arm. I turned round and looked at him, wearing a kind of dumb smile and suddenly fighting an overwhelming urge to cry. Go out to the door and open the window, he said. Huh? Go on. Go out to the door and open the window. I did as he said. The noise washed into the train like the smell of night-scented stocks, far off and fragrant, impossibly beautiful and warm. Like a billion bees humming or a zillion trees... Like a billion bees humming or a zillion tree branches waving or a thousand trillion waves strumming on a distant beach. And as we passed the thousands of people, Black people, white people, people of all colours. I saw my father. I went to Uncle Nigel's funeral that afternoon. It was like he said it would be, sombre, affected and depressing. For me, though, it was difficult to be sad. Even when Aunt Dorothy came up to me and wept against my shoulder. They played a couple of hymns which I recognised I didn't know the names of. It was all I could do to stop myself from standing up and shouting, Hey, he doesn't want this! Put on some Hendrix! But I managed it. I didn't go back to the house. Instead, I rented a car and bought a large spade, some sacking, and a cassette of Electric Ladyland. Then I rang Susan and told her that I loved her. She was shocked, asked if I was okay. I said I was. We spoke for a while, nothing important in itself, but somehow just speaking was the real important thing. I think I found it, I told her. Found what? she said. Me? Us? I don't know. Whatever it was that we'd lost. Before I hung up, she said, John? Yes? I said, I... I love you too. And that night I went down to the grave again. It didn't take me long. The earth was still soft and I managed to get it all put back the way I'd found it. Uncle Nigel was right, he had lost a lot of weight at the end. His body couldn't have been much more than about 90 pounds. We drove until we hit open countryside playing cross-town traffic and food in child at full volume. Then I parked the car and hiked for another 40 minutes or so into some real wild woodland. There were no paths, so no evidence that people ever came here, just as he had said. I took him deep into a dense wood, getting ripped and lacerated by the clinging branches while all the time I was protecting his body slumped over my shoulder. 
when we got to where he described, I propped him against a huge birch tree. I thought I heard a voice say, Thanks, John. But he never showed himself. Maybe it was just the wind. On the way back, still playing Hendrix, I thought back to the train journey and our conversation. And I thought of what Uncle Nigel had told me he'd done with my father's body. There's a small gully out among the rocks near the bridge with a special little collection of bones resting in the bottom where no one can reach them. Being daily wind-blown, rain-washed and sun-dried, listening to the sounds of existence. And as the trees drifted by outside the window, I thought of what Uncle Nigel had said about life being one long note. I thought of Susan waiting for me. I wonder what my own note sounded like. I think it sounds like this.